Hey guys, welcome back. Well, it's been a long time since I put out a video. Sorry about that. But I have been able to do a lot of imaging, and I've been doing a lot of imaging along with my new Pro Astro Gear autofocus mount that I've been using with my Red Cat 51 to perform autofocus runs while I get some sleep. And so I thought, now that I've been using this for about five months, I would share with you the findings and my experience with the Pro Astro Gear mount and an assessment of its consistency and accuracy over a wide range of temperature and multiple, multiple, over 200 autofocus runs. Let's get started. Mike finally made this engineer give up and buy a plastic autofocus mount for the Red Cat 51. Well, first of all, I got tired of going out to focus the uh, Red Cat manually. As you, many of you know who have this telescope, the helical focuser is very coarse. It's very difficult to precisely dial in the focus using a Batonoff mask and the Batonoff score from, say, the Batonoff Grabber software and get that precisely focused notification from the software. And then once you get there, if you get there, you've got to tighten down the focus lock ring and that in turn may actually shift the focus off of your optimum focus. So it's really a pain in the neck to do the focusing with this Red Cat helical focuser. And I finally gave in and decided that some of the issues I had with Plastic parts may not be that big of an issue after all. I was concerned a little bit about the mechanical slop of plastic parts versus machined aluminum. I was concerned about plastic on plastic wear. And I was concerned about the consistency and the accuracy of the results I would get, although I wasn't getting that consistent and accurate results just doing it manually. And finally, I wondered if the plastic can stand up to do heat and cold. So that's why a long term review like this, I think, is necessary for this kind of component because. A lot of the things that I was concerned about was how it would behave after months of use, after a full season of use with the Red Cat 51. There are two general options that you can go down to implement an autofocus uh, mechanism with the Red Cat 51. First, there's a belt drive. Many of you are using that. It's used quite successfully. I chose to go with a gear drive system, and in this case, I went with the Pro Astro Gear mount that sold through Agena Astro Products. It's only $80, which if it works, that's a perfectly fair fee. When you buy the Pro Astro Gear mount, this is what you get in the package. You get the plastic mount that bolts on, screws on to the Red Cat 51 telescope bracket. And then this part here is where you'll insert the ZWO autofocuser, the autofocuser from ZWO, whether it's the original autofocuser or the new autofocuser, the five volt EAF, both fit in here perfectly easily, no issues there. When this is mounted on the telescope, you can attach a Vixen style shoe that you can use to hold a guide scope if that's what you're using. Over here, you can use these slotted holes to attach your ASI Air if you're using one of those. And then you get this ring gear, which on one side you have gear teeth, as you can see here. The other side is smooth, but this clamps on and around the helical focuser of the Red Cat. A sprocket, a drive sprocket, is screwed onto, with a set screw, is screwed onto the end of the shaft of the CWO electronic focuser. And then you get an extra drive sprocket just in case the first one is damaged or wears down. And you get lots and lots of screws to attach the various types of hardware. So this is very handy, along with these small Allen wrenches, which are a pain in the neck to go find if you don't happen to have those. And it's easy to install on the Red Cat. You just put this gear on a bit loosely at first, and then you attach the electronic focuser into this area using these two screws drive sprocket goes on the end of the shaft and in this area is where the bracket the autofocus mount is attached to the red cat 51. the nice thing about the package is you do have some options in terms of the additional screws you have to mount hardware and in terms of this additional drive sprocket to uh, combat where it should that occur now i did have some fit up issues a fairly minor one was that i needed to rotate the telescope within the bracket just to move this thumb screw that is a set screw for this rotator so that I could have easy access to the thumb screw and be able to operate it without a problem. And so that was a trivial thing. The next thing uh, that you wanna be aware of while you're assembling it is you wanna leave these screws that go down into the bracket for the Red Cat a little loose, just as you want to leave the ring gear here a little loose. You can see a gap here between the two sides. With these screws a bit loose, you'll be sliding this back and forth along this surface here. And then that will allow you to move the sprocket 
in and out and get good engagement with this ring gear. And as you're doing that, you can kind of rotate the ring gear so that you get that good engagement. And then once everything is in a good position, you can lock down these two screws, tighten up these screws without rotating the ring gear, and you'll be good to go. Now, with my first generation Red Cat 51, I was having some interference of this edge here against this bracket screw. Some of you have later generation Red Cats and you have not had this problem with the uh, fit up. So this may only be a problem for those of us with the first generation uh, Red Cat. In any case, it was very easy to resolve given that these are plastic parts. I've got a Dremel tool, but a hand file would, would serve just as easily. And I just carved out some plastic here where this interference is. And once I did that, it's good to go. So here you see the Pro Astro Gear mount attached to the telescope and the telescope outside on the mount. We're looking down the barrel of the Red Cat 51. This is the dew heater here. This is the focus lock ring. You want to leave this thing loose. You don't want to have it engaged even slightly against this helical focuser. You want the helical focuser to be able to move freely as this gear turns and this ring gear rotates the focuser. So leave this loose so that you don't generate excess force in these gears. As you can see here, I've got the gears nicely engaged. You want to get as close engagement as you can between these two uh, sets of gears so that you have good contact and consistent contact, and you're not just uh, operating on the edge of the teeth here that can cause excessive wear uh, very early. So getting good engagement, uh, but not making it too tight. You don't want binding here. That's, a, that's the key thing in setting this up and why you want freedom of movement and leaving these screws that we were talking about loose so that you can slide this up and down to come in and out of engagement. Now, as you can see here, I've got a Vixen style, uh, ZWO Vixen style shoe mounted on this flat surface here. I don't have a guide scope. I'm using an off-axis guider with my setups, but it does give me an opportunity to mount an L-shaped bracket. fits perfectly in here. And then I use that with my ASI 120MC uh, color camera and this fisheye lens, about 155 degree field of view, that gives me a, uh, a cloud cam view of the night's uh, imaging session. And I usually, uh, one of the first things I do in the morning is pull out those images that I'm getting about one every minute or so and string those into a video to see if anything untoward happened. But just to remind you guys what that looks like when we're using it, this is from imaging from a recent session here. You can see we start off imaging. I'm looking at the heart and soul nebula for a couple of hours. I'm doing a couple of autofocus runs during this period. And then we switch over to the spaghetti nebula, SH2240. And I'll watch this all the way up to about the meridian. Again, doing several autofocus runs inside here. And then it will go back down and pick up SH2-296, which is the Seagull Nebula, until it gets to the uh, Meridian, does a Meridian flip, and follows it down. And then, of course, the Cloud Cam gets its name because it attracts clouds. And finally, the telescope parks itself. By and large, this whole setup has been working for the last five months without any modifications, without certainly without any tweaking of the mechanical setup here with the Pro Astro Gear mount. So I've been very pleased with it. It's a very um, solid connection and it's been working very well. Some tweaking is required to dial in the parameters for your Nina Hocus Focus setup. I use uh, Nina and I use the Hocus Focus plugin to do the focusing. I'm using the star uh, half flux radius method along with the hyperbolic curve fit method. Now, the main parameters that you want to set up is that. Uh, for me, I'm using four autofocus steps of 23 motor steps each. So it's really the more important thing is this the product of these two numbers because that describes the extent to which you go out of focus on each side of optimum focus to define the hyperbolic curve. And you want to go far enough to define a good hyperbolic curve, but not so far that the uh, stars that you're seeing when you're out of focus are so far out of focus that they can't be recognized as stars. I have found that a value at around 23, but I 25 would work, 30 would be fine. Staying within plus or minus 100 steps, in other words, four times this number, uh, is what you want to do. If you want to use five autofocus steps, then take 100 and divide it by five and use 20 motor steps. But I have found four to work, four autofocus steps to work very well, along with paired when paired with 23 to 25 focuser motor steps. 
Another big parameter that is important is the backlash control. I'm using overshoot method and I have 80 motor steps set for that and that's been working very well. And then finally, a number that I found useful when using my SCT, a very long vocal length SCT, is to put an R squared limit in place so that if the R squared value, meaning how well does the data you get, your, your star HFR data, how well does it fit the hyperbolic curve? If that R squared value is low, you may not be getting a good curve fit and therefore you may not be getting good focus. You can still get pretty good focus with a fairly low R squared value, but I find with my SCT anyway that I want to be pretty picky and have Nina re-execute an autofocus run if the R squared value comes in below this number, 0.9. I went ahead and used 0.9 here, as I'll explain a little bit later. It doesn't matter at all. I'm getting such good results out of this uh, combination that uh, it, Nina has never had to re-perform an autofocus run, even with an R-squared value of 0 0.9. And I'm using the luminance filter only. I have the Antlia filters. They are parfocal, so that means I can get away with just performing focus with the luminance filter. And I've been using my new ASI 294mm in Ben 1 mode to do the focusing and I'm using about a six second exposure and all of those parameters have stayed the same over these past five months. Here you can see the curves that I got on the first, one of the early first nights that I started using this system back in July, uh, late July of this year. And over here you can see the same curves that I got just recently late in December of this year. Back here in late July and early August, we have some pretty high temperatures. so. The first focus of the night was performed at a uh, 34.2 degrees C. And you can see that these numbers over here, these are the R squared values. I'm getting R squared values all in the 0.99 to one range, meaning I'm getting better than uh, 0.99 throughout the focusing. And each one of these curves represents an autofocus that was done that night. We went from, in late July, a high temperature of 34.2 degrees to in late December, a low temperature of minus 4.7 degrees. So that's a pretty big temperature range that we're seeing here. Also, what I'm finding is that the optimum focus point that I've been at on the cold side and the optimum focus point I've been at on the hot side is about 200 motor steps apart. So that's all that we're having to move that helical focuser in order to cover a, a season's range of motion for this focuser. But what does 200 steps look like? Let's take a look at this video and I'll show you. Now, as we see this, we're gonna see a 100 step increment right there, so that's 100. There's 200, and then there's 300 steps. You're not gonna move more than that in a given season. You can see that focuser, the helical focuser is just barely moving. Another thing to keep in mind here is that the number of gear teeth on the drive sprocket and the ring gear are very limited. We're only engaging maybe three teeth. And so think about that when you think about what is the wear potential between these teeth, because if they do wear, all you have to do is kind of detach things, rotate the ring gear, not attached to the helical focuser, rotate the ring gear independent of the helical focuser by about three gear teeth, run your auto focuser, uh, not engaged with the ring gear, uh, by about 300 steps, and you'll be operating with uh, fresh gear teeth in both instances. But that's a hint as to why it is it's so difficult to focus the Red Cat 51 with this helical focuser, because what you just saw there was a range of uh, 100, 100 steps in each of three increments. And yet when you go out to do a focus, all you're doing is changing the steps down to maybe three steps to four steps. So in other words, it's just 1% of the overall motion that you saw there. And that's what is so uh, so challenging uh, to, to do manually with any level of consistency. Over here on the right hand side you can see the focuser position at optimum focus and down here is the air temperature at which that focus was performed and each one of these dots represents one of the over 200 autofocus runs that I've performed and you can see a very clear trend here. You can fit this to a line and it's a very accurate line at 4.4 motor steps per degree C. You can see also here that we are getting a little tighter grouping of points up here when it's hot than we are down here. It's a little more scattered at the cold end of the range. And we'll see that over here as well. Here is the 
uh, half flux radius, presumably in pixels, as calculated by Nina and Hocus Focus. And you can see how that number varies as we go across in uh, air temperature. There is an ever so slight decrease in the half flux radius, meaning we're getting tighter stars out here at the hot end of the uh, season versus the cold end of the season. But I'm attributing that variation here back in the cold is when we have denser air and, and a higher density of air might lead to more scattering of light. By and large, I've been getting excellent and very consistent results, whether it's been hot or cold, over this 40 degree temperature range. Another reason why I think it's the air density and not the mechanical variability that's leading to that tire scatter in the cold air is this picture here. What I'm plotting here is a histogram of the R squared values. In other words, how good is the data fitting the hyperbolic curve? Remember, an R squared value of one means every data point is exactly on the line of the hyperbola. That's not quite what we're seeing in this uh, real world example that I have here. This data point's a little off, that one's a little off, this one is a little off, but the R squared value that we're seeing is still very high. This is higher than 0.99. Uh, in order for it to round up to one. So it's not exactly one, but it's a very good curve fit. And this was happened to be recorded at minus three degrees C. So I'm getting very good performance uh, in this particular instance, but it's not just this particular instance. I've done over 200 of these focus runs this uh, season, and this is a histogram showing all of the runs. And roughly 78.5% of them have R squared values in excess of 0.9. In other words, the curve looks like this one here. Another 19% fall in the 0.98 to 0.99 range. And then there's a smattering of a, a handful of runs that fell down uh, as low as, but no lower than 0.95 as an R squared value. So when I talked about that R squared value of 0.9 being a limit to tell Nina, okay, you're down at 0.9, go back and do the autofocus again. I've never even seen that with this combination because the lowest autofocus uh, R squared value I've had is still bigger than 0.95. So this is actually one of the things that was very shocking to me. I did not expect, given the coarseness of the helical focuser on the red cat, and given the mechanical tolerance that is consistent with 3D printed plastic parts that I would ever see this kind of consistency in the autofocus runs. So I've been using this Pro Astro Gear, the call so-called Black Cat Focuser mount uh, for the Red Cat 51 for about five months now. All of my focus runs have been performed with Nina and the Hocus Focus plugin, and everything has been uh, working great over these past five months and 200 autofocus runs under my belt so far, and a fairly hefty, for me anyway, temperature range of about 40 degrees C. But I'm still getting 95% of my autofocus runs to give me a hyperbolic curve fit with an R squared of 0.98. I'm not uh, as concerned at all now about the tolerance and the plastic parts. I'm able to control that quite well with the backlash setting in Nina, nor am I concerned about the wear of the plastic components. And I haven't seen any effects. I'm getting as good a focus in the last day of this season as I was was on the first day. So certainly after one season, I'm not seeing an effect. In fact, I probably have more doubts about the longevity of the ZWO Focuser than I do the Pro Astro Gear uh, 3D pl printed plastic parts. So all in all, everything's working out great with this plastic, yes, plastic Pro Astro Gear Focuser mount. If you're in the market for one of these, I certainly recommend this one. For now, clear skies and go get some sleep. I'll check in with you guys later.